I think. Hi, Carolina. Hi there. Hi, Dr. Osborne. Nice to Hi. You. Nice to meet you. Thanks for joining us today. Yeah, thanks for having me. We had 72 registrations, so I think oh, it's wow. be a great turnout today. Yeah. People do not tend to be early, though. So, yeah. with, <laughs> as you know, with the back to back Zoom life that everyone is living still. <clears throat> but you're meeting with a few students afterwards, I think. So, that will be nice. Yeah. I'm looking we'll forward to that. Good. Yeah. They'll be excited. <clears throat> and I look forward to reading this paper that I had sent to me. So <laughs> did it change anything to do green space differently? I wonder, do you know? I can't remember what the results were before, but green space definitely looks like a confounder and oh, that's good. Um, before it didn't. Yeah. Okay. So it, it did change it quite a bit then. Okay. Um, the effect of adding green space to the model and the effect of adding a flexible function of space to the model are about the same, which is shocking. Like it's such a clean example. Who would have guessed? Aww. Good job, us. Yeah, <laughs> good job, you. <laughs> hey, Brian. Hello. Nice to meet everyone else. Yeah. <clears throat> Hi, Rebecca. Hi. Good to see you. I know you too. Rebecca and I went to high school together. Oh, wow. Nice. Yeah. <laughs> high school makes me laugh. My husband's high school mascot was the lambkin. Not just a lamb, but a small lamb. That's so, pretty cute. It's something. Yeah. Very fierce. Our high school mascot was something fierce, like lions uh -huh. or something, but we were a very academic, not fierce school. We should have been the lambkins. <laughs> Hi, everybody. I think we'll just wait on two more minutes. Does that sound about right, Carolina? Okay. <clears throat> Yeah, I think we usually start around three, three minutes in or so um, okay. to give everybody, give uh, the talk enough time for and then questions after. Yeah, that sounds great. Yeah, Betsy, we usually pretty much hold questions till the end. So if there's something burning, people can jump in, but you can expect mostly just listening and then Q&A at the end. Okay, I'm very happy to be interrupted especially if something's too technical. I'm very happy to pause and explain in words. Cool. So people can feel free. Also, actually, Brian could answer questions in the chat as we go. Sure, yeah, if there are questions, that's great. Yeah, I'm happy to do that. Great. actually a really nice model. Everyone that gives a talk should bring along a partner to answer questions in the chat. And there's a new online causal inference seminar that happens weekly ever since the start of the pandemic. I think it's hosted by Stanford and they request that every speaker bring a co-author to answer questions in the chat. It works really well. Yeah, that's a really cool idea. Okay. Yeah, I'm definitely going to take note on that and maybe suggest it for future seminars. All right. Great. So 
I think I'll get started. We're, we're at a decent capacity here. Uh, so hi, everyone. Welcome. Uh, really excited to be here today and introduce my good friend and collaborator, Dr. Betsy Ogburn. So Betsy is an associate professor of biostatistics at the Johns Hopkins Bloomberg School of Public Health, where she focuses on causal inference. Um, and a lot of her work is around social networks and interference, which is where like one subject's treatment um, affects someone else's treatment and what that means for our modeling. Um, so I've been working with Betsy since 2012, but today is the first time I've really looked at her CV. And I'm going to be honest, I'm glad I hadn't looked er earlier because I'm, I'm now pretty intimidated. Um, <laughs> Betsy holds a BA from Harvard in philosophy and mathematics. She has an MS in statistical genetics from Columbia and also a PhD in biostatistics from Harvard. She is an associate editor for many statistical journals like Biostatistics, JAZA, EpiMethods, the Harvard Review of Data Science. Um, one very fun and important fact that I learned today was that from 2007 to 2008, Betsy served as a data analyst and statistical consultant at the Harvard Law School, who was her supervisor. Elizabeth Warren. Um, so one thing I will say is what's unusual about Betsy as a biostatistician is I find she does a really nice job of explaining complicated biostatistics to everyone else. And so with that, I'm really excited to hand it over to Dr. Ogburn. That's the nicest introduction I've ever had. And now I have to uh, live up to that and do a good job of explaining <laughs> biostatistical concepts today. So as I was saying a little earlier, I'm very happy to be stopped throughout for questions, especially if something is too technical and I should try to do a better job explaining it. Um, and you can also put questions in the chat and my co-author and um, advisee, uh, Brian Gilbert, who's here, um, can try to answer them there. So today I'm going to talk about what some some lessons that the kind of field of causal inference, which is a, a field that develops statistical methods for teasing apart causal associations from non-causal associations. So what we can learn from that the body of work in causal inference about estimating the effects of spatial environmental exposures. And this is joint work with Brian, um, Joan, and my colleague Abhi Dutta at Hopkins. Um, so first, I'm going to introduce the motivating example behind this work, um, which I'll return to with results at the end of the talk. And that is, what is the causal effect of PM 2.5 exposure on birth weight for um, 2013 births in California? That's the year 2013. Um, so I'll introduce that example, then I'll explain how spatial confounding plays a role in answering this and similar causal environmental exposure questions. Um, then I'll briefly review the methods that are most commonly used to answer this kind of question, the, the kind of standard methods that people tend to use um, with a focus on what can go wrong when using these methods. And then I'll describe new methods um, that, well, actually they're they're established causal inference methods, but they are new to spatial environmental settings. So I'll describe new methods that avoid the problems of the kind of standard traditional methods. And then finally, I'll present some simulation results and return to the question of interest about whether PM 2.5 has a causal effect on birth weight. Um, so this, um, this picture here is showing the variation in average daily PM 2.5 exposure across the state of California. And I wanna make a few points here. The first point is that clearly there's a spatial pattern to this exposure. Um, and I'll explain shortly why it's important to account for this spatial pattern when we run statistical analyses. Um, and then the second point is that other variables like other environmental exposures, SES, um, other any other variable that has a similar spatial pattern could be associated with this exposure. And if these variables are also associated with the outcome with birth weight, then they could be confounders of the causal effect of PM 2.5 on birth weight. 
this is a scatter plot that Brian made showing the unadjusted association between PM 2.5 and birth weight in our data. And we don't want to interpret this causally because they're undoubtedly important confounders that this scatter plot does not account for. Um, and so the, the ultimate analysis that we'll do will be a, a, an adjusted analysis, like a regression where we're gonna control for potential confounders. Um, but there's a little bit of evidence here, and I'll show you more evidence later on, that the relationship between PM 2.5 and birth weight might not be linear. This curve is fairly flat, this kind of best fit curve, but it looks to have inflection points maybe here, maybe another one here. Um, and it turns out, as you'll see at the end of the talk, that uh, assuming a linear relationship here is not going to give us the right answer. Um, so ultimately, we will want to run an analysis looking at the effect of PM 2.5 exposure on birth weight that adjusts for confounders in order to estimate a causal effect, rather than just estimating the kind of raw association that you can see here. Um, and in our setting, we have data on several potential confounders. Uh, we have race ethnicity, parity, um, the codal chuck index, which is an index of the of prenatal care utilization, um, maternal age, and maternal education. And these are kind of standard individual level covariates to control for in this kind of analysis. But we also think that there are likely to be unmeasured confounders, possibly with spatial patterns to them. And as an example of this kind of spatially patterned unmeasured confounder, I'm going to use green space. We actually did measure green space. I've got a, a picture of it here, um, but in it's not standard to control for, for green space. So in many settings, this would be truly unmeasured. Um, so green space has been shown to be positively associated with birth weight and negatively associated with fine particulate matter. And um, in, in fact, we, we did measure green space uh, for the purposes of illustrating the effects of, of controlling for or failing to control for a confounder of this nature, but we had to go out of our way to link um, census tract level green space to maternal residents. And it's not typical to control for this variable in the many causal analyses that have been done of um, the effect of PM 2.5 on birth weight. Other examples of types of confounders that are spatially varying and tend not to be measured um, include exposure to other environmental toxins beyond PM 2.5. Um, and uh, well, I'll give other examples a little later. Okay, so how is a causal question like the effect of PM 2.5 exposure on birth weight typically answered? Generally, researchers fit a spatial regression model regressing the outcome Y, that's birth weight in our case, on the exposure, that's um, average daily PM 2.5 exposure, X. And they include as regressors measured confounders or measured covariates C. This is a, you know, a very typical linear regression model. What makes this a spatial regression is um, one of two things. Either that, um, you know, if you think back to your intro epi or biostats class, um, when in a, in a typical linear regression model, a fundamental assumption is that these error terms, these epsilons are independent, they're IID, independent and identically distributed. In a spatial regression model, we allow these error terms to be not independent, to be dependent based on spatial proximity. So a spatial regression model, one version of a spatial regression model just allows these error terms to be similar if two observations, two births in this case, are have um, maternal residence addresses that are close in space. And then the epsilons, the error terms will be independent if the the locations of the observations are very far in space. Um, and that's a, a generalized least squares model that allows the, the errors, the epsilons to be correlated based on location. Another version of a spatial regression model um, tries to absorb all of that spatial structure 
by adding a flexible function of space to the regression as an extra regressor. And this is often fit with splines. Um, uh, and there, there are a variety of ways to, to fit this model, but the what's common about them is that they're kind of um, absorbing spatial dependence, not by allowing the error terms to be dependent, but rather by um, kind of capturing any spatial, um, any any unmeasured spatial variables that affect y. That's kind of the the philosophy behind this flexible function of space. Um, as a brief aside, I want to explain why it's important to use a spatial regression model for spatial data as opposed to an ordinary OLS, ordinary least squares regression model. Um, it's it's very important to when when you're data are dependent and specifically exhibit a, a dependence that's informed by spatial location, it's important to take that dependence into account. And that's, so if you, if you use a regular old regression model, when in fact you have spatially dependent data, the result will be um, confidence intervals that are too narrow um, or p-values that are too small, kind of arbitrarily deflated. What When you think that you have independent data when in fact the data are dependent you you think that there's more information about the question of interest in your data than there actually is so dependent data data that's not independent data that has the spatial structure um, actually results in more highly variable estimates than independent data um, the reason is that there's less information in dependent data than there is in independent data you could think of when you have independent data and you have a sample of size 100, let's say, and you bring you you go out and you get funding to collect another 10 observations, those 10 observations are bringing 10 bits of information about your question of interest into your bucket of data. But if your data are not independent, if they're dependent, those 10 new observations that you went to great pains to collect have some independent new information, but they have some redundant information. You can kind of think of a dependent observation as um, having some redundancy due to the dependence. It's like some of the some of what you would like to extract from some of the information you'd like to extract from those observations you already have in your data um, due to the dependent structure. So um, these are just some simulations that show that if you have dependent data and you treat it as if it's independent, you get confidence intervals that undercover. So you estimate a 95% confidence interval and you report it, but it turns out, so these are actually, these are confidence intervals from independent data. Uh, and the true value here is zero. And each of these bars is a confidence interval. And you can see above this dotted line are the confidence intervals that fail to cover the truth. And a 95% confidence interval should cover the truth 95% of the time. It does in this case when the data are independent. But as we go across these simulations, we're introducing more and more dependence into the data. And the 95% confidence intervals start to cover only 82% of the time, then 78% of the time, and all the way down to 70% of the time. And if you have a confidence interval, a purported 95% confidence interval that actually only covers the truth 70% of the time, you're going to have a replication issue. That's, um, you you know, that means that 30% of the time you could be reporting false positives. Um, so all this is to say, it's very important to account for dependence when data are not independent. Okay, um, so now I wanna talk about when we're licensed to interpret the exposure coefficient from a spatial regression causally. Um, and first I'm going to give an extremely brief introduction to causal inference. You don't have to worry about the notation here. Uh, I'm going to use this kind of, um, this causal notation, but I'll explain what I mean in words. And when I come back to defining causal effects later, I'll, I'll try to remember to, um, to explain exactly what I mean. So to differentiate between um, effects that are causal 
and effects that are not causal, I'm going to define causal effects in terms of potential outcomes or counterfactuals. And that's what this notation is. This is the, um, the outcome that we could have observed for an individual if we could have randomized or forced them to have exposure value little x. So an associational analysis might ask, what is the mean of y? What's the average value of, of the outcome conditional on a particular exposure value? But a causal analysis asks, what value of the outcome would we have observed if we could have intervened to give everybody um, the same exposure value, little x. Um, so usually in, in causal inference settings, we're talking about a binary treatment. Obviously in environmental settings, we're talking about continuous exposures, but you can think of a, a causal effect as being the, the average difference contrast between two potential outcomes. What outcome would we have, have observed if we could have given everybody treatment um, compared to what outcome we would have observed if we could have given everybody control. Um, and the, the problem is that we can't observe these potential outcomes. We can only observe realized outcomes. We see somebody's outcome under the exposure value that they happened to receive, but we can't observe what would have happened to them if they'd been randomized or forced to receive a different level of exposure. So the field of causal inference is all about making hopefully realistic um, assumptions that allow us to learn about these potential outcomes from um, the data that we do get to observe, which is just data on the, the outcomes, the exposure and the covariates, but not these um, kind of uh, hypothetical outcomes that we would have observed if everybody had taken treatment or if everybody had had a particular level of PM 2.5 exposure. Um, so kind of the, the crucial uh, ask, the, the crucial uh, task that differentiates causal inference from other areas of statistics is just thinking about these assumptions that link the data that we can actually see in the world to these hypothetical potential outcomes that we wish we could observe. Um, and there are going to be two, I'm going to focus today on two of these assumptions that are, are very typical when we're trying to interpret a statistical analysis as giving us a, a, a something with a causal interpretation. Um, the first of those assumptions is the positivity or overlap assumption. This assumption says that within levels of covariates, we can observe all possible values of the exposure. And when this assumption holds, we say that the data supports the causal question, meaning the data, meaning data exists that can tell us um, what would have happened to somebody if they'd had a different exposure value. When this assumption doesn't hold, then many methods, including the kind of traditional spatial regression methods, will extrapolate away from the data. So if, for example, there are no residents of Northern California with the highest values of PM 2.5 exposure, then a, a regression model will extrapolate and assume that the relationship between high values of exposure and birth weight in Northern California um, is the same as the relationship elsewhere in the state or that the relationship between low values of, of PM 2.5 exposure and birth weight kind of continues along the same linear trajectory as you get to hypothetical higher values that we didn't actually collect data for. But this kind of extrapolation is risky because if the data are not supporting particular exposure values, then we can have a situation like this, where um, the, the truth and the extrapolated model are actually quite different from each other. So the positivity or overlap assumption is designed to ensure that this never happens, that we never extrapolate beyond the data. Um, and then the, the second assumption is the no unmeasured confounder assumption. This is also sometimes called ignorability. Um, and this is the assumption that if there are any confounders, and you can think of a confounder here as a, a common cause of exposure and outcome. So if there are any confounders for the relationship between exposure and outcome, we measure those confounders and we control for them in our analysis. In environmental and other spatial settings, 
there are often unmeasured spatially varying confounders. So we're going to use green space as the a paradigmatic example of this in our data analysis. Um, another example is other environmental exposures. So for example, if PM 2.5 is generated from a, a polluting power plant, then that power plant could be emitting other harmful pollutants as well that aren't captured by PM 2.5 measurements, but could be affecting the, out, the same outcome. Um, and then lots of individual level covariates that could be confounders are also spatially varying to some extent, like um, things like income, access to healthcare, um, other socioeconomic factors. These tend to have geographic patterns, um, although it's not quite as strong as with green space or environmental exposures. Um, as an aside, uh, so if, if you're familiar with the term spatial confounding, I'm going to use that term to mean what I just described, unmeasured confounders that have a spatial pattern to them. And that is one use of this term in the spatial literature. But the term spatial confounding is also used to refer to a few other concepts um, that are not really related to confounding in the causal sense. Um, and so that's just what this bullet point is. This bullet point is just a caveat for people who are familiar with spatial confounding and have seen it used in conjunction with issues of concurvity or regularization bias or um, collinearity with a random effect. These are um, things that make statistical estimation challenging, but I think it's confusing to use the term confounding to refer to these issues. Um, so for the purposes of today's talk, spatial confounding means unmeasured confounders that have a spatial pattern to them. So oftentimes when researchers use a partially linear spatial regression model like this, um, they describe this term, this flexible function of space that I said you could add to absorb the spatial dependence in the outcome. Um, they describe this this term as controlling for spatial confounding. The idea is that a flexible function of space here should be able to capture all of the unmeasured sources of spatial variation in the outcome. This is sometimes correct, but it's not, it's not straightforward. Um, so this requires two things. First of all, that the unmeasured confounders are fully explained by space. And second of all, that this model, which encodes some pretty strong assumptions, is correctly specified. So what does it mean for a confounder to be fully explained by space? It means that there is no variation in that confounder that's not captured by like latitude and longitude. So some examples where this might be the case are like geographic covariates, like altitude or proximity to the coast. Um, Less clear, but still possibly plausible examples are green space and secondary environmental exposures. I think it's it's possible that um, that those could be captured by a, a function of space, this G of S term. Um, but examples of of common kinds of unmeasured confounders that do have some spatial variation, but are definitely not going to be fully explained by latitude and longitude are things like income and socioeconomic variables. These definitely tend to exhibit strong geographic patterns. You know, there are rich neighborhoods and poor neighborhoods, rich parts of the country and poor parts of the country, but there's also um, quite a bit of variability within even small geographic areas. And that is kind of the, the characteristic um, that tells us that we will not be able to fully explain these variables just using a flexible function of latitude and longitude. Um, so the problem with this, this last type of, of um, confounder is that a flexible function of space might not capture the variation that's actually important to confounding. So for example, there's some research to suggest that um, that relative income or relative wealth can be important predictors for some types of outcomes. Um, so, you know, having more or less wealth than your neighbors can have an effect even over and above um, just raw 
wealth or income. And this is a kind of variation that can never be captured by a function of space. It's, um, you know, what a, a function of space it could capture like the um, average income or wealth distribution across neighborhoods, but it can never capture the micro variation within small geographic areas. Um, so in summary, we can, Po it's, it might be possible to use this kind of strategy of adding a flexible function of space to a regression model to control for confounders like these that could plausibly be captured by a, a function of space by latitude and longitude. Um, but with confounders like these that have some spatial variation, but some variation that can't be explained for, by space, um, we, we certainly can't fully control for them using the strategy of, of adding a flexible function of space to a model. Um, and then the second, so I started with the question of um, when we can interpret this coefficient on the exposure in a, a spatial regression model like this causally. Um, and so one, one uh, necessary condition is, that this function of space captures all unmeasured confounders. And the other condition is that this model must be correctly specified. Um, and this model makes some strong assumptions that are rarely, very rarely interrogated in practice, um, but I'll show you in a little bit that they can have, uh, that when those assumptions are violated, we can get really biased results. So the first assumption is that um, that the effect of the exposure on the outcome is homogeneous in space. So researchers often will include interactions between the exposure X and the measured covariate C, but it's very rare to include interactions between the exposure and the flexible function of space. So that means that if, for example, PM 2.5 has a different effect on birth weight depending on nearby green space or depending on where in the state of California you are, this model, a model like this that does not include those interactions will be misspecified and it will not adequately control for confounding. Um, and the second problem is that this model assumes that every one unit increase in the exposure has the same effect on the outcome, namely beta. A, a one unit increase in this model has um, a, a one unit increase in X um, increases Y by beta. Um, and this is the assumption of linearity or a linear effect. It's the assumption that every one unit increase is the same. Suppose the effect is not linear. So this is just a, a toy example. This is a scatter plot that Brian created of some, some toy data. And in this scatter plot, a one unit increase in the exposure from zero to one has almost no effect on the outcome, but a one unit increase from four to five has a huge effect on the outcome. So this is a, a typical nonlinear effect. Um, well, let's say we've got, we, we have this nonlinear effect, but we still just want a single summary measure of the effect of, on, of X on Y. The most sensible way to summarize this nonlinear effect into a single number is to ask what's the average of all the one unit increases? What's the average effect of a one unit increase? It's small here, it's big here, but it averages out um, to something in the middle. And that's what this red line shows. This, this red line is the average effect of a one unit increase in the exposure on the outcome. But the best fitting linear regression line, what you would get if you use the spatial model, is this blue line here. Um, and this does not correspond to any meaningful average. Um, so you can see that the, the slope of the red line is steeper than the slope of the blue line. And that means if you, if you fit a linear regression and you interpret it, as I think people often do, as the kind of average effect, even if you've got a nonlinear effect, you're going to be underestimating the blue line, the, the linear regression um, beta coefficient will underestimate the true average effect, which is given by this line. Um, all this is to say that it's sensible to want to collapse a nonlinear effect into a single summary number, but doing it by fitting a linear regression model can give a kind of nonsensical answer. There's no natural interpretation of this blue line. Okay, so um, 
are there better methods available? <laughs> the answer is yes, there are existing causal inference methods, methods that have not methods that have been used quite a bit in other application areas, but not to our knowledge in these spatial environmental settings that are really ripe for use in um, in this kind of this for this kind of question, the question of the causal effect of an environmental exposure on an outcome. So we propose three ways to kind of borrow from this existing causal inference literature to improve upon the standard spatial confounding and spatial regression methods that I've just um, been talking about. The first um, suggestion, the first proposal that we have is to define a shift causal effect. Um, so this is the average effect of, an, of a small increase in exposure. Um, and this implicitly allows for nonlinearity, um, where you know it it says what's the effect of of increasing from an exposure of value of little x to an exposure value that's slightly greater than little x, and that could be really different if you start off at little x is one versus if you start off at little x is ten. Um, it does not need we do not need to assume that all of these little incremental shifts have the same value in order to take the average of them. So this gives us the red line on the, the plot above. It's a, it's a way of defining the effect that gives us this average. Um, the second thing that we propose to do is use doubly robust estimation. This is a way of combining a model for the exposure. So that's like a regression of the exposure onto covariates with the typical outcome model, the regression of the outcome onto the exposure and covariates. Um, in order to get two chances to control for confounding. So this is a doubly robust estimation is a, a really well-known um, strategy in the causal inference world um, that's very powerful because if we can correctly model either the exposure or the outcome, we will get valid causal effect estimates. Um, so, you know, if we're, if we're not totally confident that we know how to correctly specify a model for the outcome, um, we can uh, hope that we get the model for the exposure right and vice versa. Um, the third thing that we propose to do is to use machine learning methods or non-parametric regression to do away with all the assumptions that are typical in spatial regression. So machine learning methods allow for all kinds of interactions for like polynomials on the covariates, for nonlinearity of the exposure effect, et cetera. They, um, it's, you know, I think of using these models as a way of um, not having to commit to a kind of scientific theory that's strong enough to tell us that the outcome is uh, has this form, that the outcome model has this form. You know, this this model encodes that the outcome is a sum of linear effects of the exposure and the covariates and a flexible function of space. You have to know exactly which interaction terms to put in here. If, if in fact, Y depends on X squared and not on X, you have to know that. You have to have the theory to tell you to include the X squared term. Um, and using these machine learning methods allows that to be kind of automated. Um, and as a grand finale, we can actually combine doubly robust estimation with these machine learning or non-parametric regression methods. And this is, again, a really well-known strategy in the causal inference world um, known as double machine learning. Um, that's just kind of combining double from doubly robust estimation with the machine learning. Um, and to do this, we fit a machine learning model for the exposure given the measured confounders and space. So x given c and a flexible function of space. Um, and then we separately fit a machine learning model for the outcome given exposure, measured confounders, and space. And if either one of those models captures the truth, then we will have valid causal effect estimates. And if they both capture the truth, which sh in theory should happen because we're using these really flexible models, they should, with enough data, they should be able to capture the truth. If both of the models capture the truth, then we have some really nice statistical properties. Um, specifically, we have uh, 
parametric rates of convergence, even though we've used non-parametric methods. Uh, don't worry about that if it, if it uh, those are not familiar terms, but um, it's uh, it that it's it's a, a set of properties that make um, valid statistical inference really straightforward. We can get valid p-values and confidence intervals and standard error estimates. Okay, so um, let me just come back to the shift intervention for a minute because this is actually quite important for being able to use these non-parametric machine learning methods. So remember that the standard spatial regression model assumes linearity. These regression models assume that the effect of a one unit change in the exposure X is the same for all values of X. And specifically that value is beta. It's the X coefficient in the regression. If we wanna do away with this assumption, the natural thing to do, and this is what most nonlinear regression methods would do, is to just estimate the effect curve, estimate how the, the potential outcome, how the outcome that we would have observed if we could have um, intervened to set exposure to a value little x, um, how this varies as we change x. So that's like, if I just go back up, that's like estimating. So this is a, a case of a nonlinear effect. What I'm describing here is just estimating this whole curve um, and not trying to summarize it into a single measure. Um, so this strategy gives you a whole X, Y plot. It tells you for every value of X, what's the Y value that we would have observed um, if we could have intervened to set the exposure to that value. Um, there are two downsides to this approach. The first is that it's hard to estimate a whole curve. It's a lot harder than estimating a single summary number, um, kind of statistically speaking. And the second problem is that it requires a really strong positivity or overlap assumption. So remember that the positivity assumption says that within levels of covariates, we can observe all possible values of the exposure. And this requires, for example, that even the most extreme values of PM 2.5 are observed in all parts of the state and for all levels of the, the measured covariates. And this is just empirically not the case. It's not the case that you can see extreme values of PM 2.5 throughout the state of California. But by instead going after a shift effect, so a shift effect is the effect, um, the contrast between a, a an incremental increase in exposure. So we go from exposure level X to X plus Delta. So this could be, um, if Delta is 0.5, this could be going from exposure one to exposure 1.5. Um, and this, this requires only that we can observe exposure values of X plus Delta in regions where the actual exposure was X. So if we make Delta really small, this is all but guaranteed to hold. It's saying in parts of, in area, regions of California where we tend to see low values of PM 2.5 exposure, we it has to be possible to see low values plus delta. So, you know, incrementally higher values of PM 2.5, but it's not saying that we have to have seen the highest possible values of PM 2.5. Um, so this defining effects this way is really crucial for being able to have the data to support estimating the causal effects. Um, okay, so uh, time for some results. So first I'm gonna show you simulations and then I'll come back to the question of the effect of PM 2.5 on birth weight in California. We compared the performance of seven popular spatial regression estimation methods. Um, and these all assume either linearity or homogeneity or both. Remember linearity is the assumption that the effect of exposure of a one unit increase in exposure is the same no matter what that exposure is. So going from one to two is the same as going from 10 to 11. Um, and homogeneity is the assumption that the, um, in this case, it's the it's spatial homogeneity. It's the assumption that the causal effect of PM 2.5 exposure is the same everywhere in the state of California. Um, so these seven kind of existing traditional methods all assume one or both of those standard assumptions. Um, then we compared those to four machine learning methods. So these are models for the outcome, Y, 
that are non-parametric and they allow for all kinds of interactions and non-linearity. And then finally, we added in three double machine learning methods. These are the, the methods that we're going to, to recommend. These are kind of the, the state of the art strongest um, methods. These methods combine a model for the outcome plus a model for the exposure, both of which are estimated non-parametrically. So on this slide, you're seeing results from simulations in which the outcome actually was linear in X and the effect of X on Y actually was the same across all locations. So in these simulations, the standard spatial regression models are correct. And this plot is showing bias, that's what these bars represent, in effect estimates across several hundred simulations um, Sample size 1,000, that's the orange, or 10,000, that's the turquoise. Um, so there are two points that I want to make on this slide. The first is that there are two methods that really stand out here for being biased. Um, RSR, or restricted spatial regression, was a very popular method for a few years, but was recently shown to be biased. And sure enough, we see that it performs badly in all settings. Um, and RF here is a, a machine learning method known as random forest. And it's a method that requires a lot of data to work well. Um, so I think what's happening here is just that even with a sample size of 10,000, we don't have enough, enough data for this, this particular method to work very well. But other than these two methods, everything performs just about equally well. Um, the, the standard methods and the fancier methods. And this is just a sanity check. Um, for two things. So th this is a setting where the standard methods are meant to, to perform well. The assumptions that they rely on hold in this setting. Um, so we expected all of these, these are the standard methods. We, we expected these methods to perform well. Um, the sanity check is that our fancier methods, which are out here, actually starting here, these are the fancier methods, aside from random forest, they don't mess things up. So it's like, if, if the, if the, the truth is very simple and a simple method would work well, using a fancier method isn't going to be particularly harmful. Um, now we started to make the simulation settings a bit more interesting. So in this setting, the effect is non-linear. The effect of exposure X on outcome Y is not linear. The effect of a one unit shift in X is different depending on whether X is low or high. Um, and these, are the standard methods that assume linearity. And you can see that they're biased. Um, these are the fancier methods that do not assume linearity. And aside from random forest, which is still kind of the ugly stepchild, um, our, our methods do perform well. They can capture that nonlinearity. They're not kind of tripped up by the fact that there's this complication in the way the world works. And here the effect is heterogeneous. So that is to say that the, the effect of the exposure on the outcome can vary across space. And a correctly specified model has to allow for interactions between the exposure and the flexible function of space. And again, standard methods that assume homogeneity are biased and are fancier methods do pretty well. Um, and you can see, so there is a little bit of bias here, but um, you can see that as sample size increases, that bias is decreasing. The turquoise bars are, are showing less bias than the orange bars. And that suggests that although we are seeing a little bit of bias here, it would, it would decrease as, as the sample size increases probably. And then finally, this is a simulation setting where there's an unmeasured confounder that has a spatial pattern, but um, it also has some non-spatial variation to it. So this is a, set, a setting where the confounder is kind of like income, where income has a spatial pattern to it, but it also has micro-level variation that cannot be captured by a flexible function of space. And none of the methods can handle this, which is exactly what we expect to see. This is a setting where the only way to estimate valid causal effects would be to go out and collect data on that unmeasured confounder. If you have unmeasured confounding by income, um, controlling for a, a flexible function of space 
could help mitigate that confounding, but it's not going to control for it. It's going to leave bias on the table. And the only solution is to go out and measure income. Okay, um, let's come back to the motivating question. Does PM 2.5 exposure during pregnancy have a causal effect on birth weight? There's a substantial previous literature on this, um, but all previous studies, as far as we could tell, have used the standard partially linear um, regression models, the kind of standard spatial regression model that I talked about at the top of the talk. Um, the, these various analyses have re resulted in a, a wide range of effect estimates and um, a recent meta-analysis combined them all to estimate an effect of um, a 28 gram decrease in birth weight per 10 microgram per meter cubed increase in average daily PM 2.5 exposure during pregnancy. In our own analyses, we estimated a much smaller shift intervention effect. So we estimated the effect of a 0.1 um, microgram per meter cubed increase in average daily PM 2.5 exposure during pregnancy instead of a 10 microgram per meter cubed increase. And the reason that we targeted such a small effect is that we found that the positivity assumption did not hold for larger shifts. So that is, uh, we were always able to observe nearby subjects with a 0.1 microgram greater exposure, but if we went up to 10 or even just one microgram, we found that there were locations where there was not enough variability in the exposure to support that hypothetical intervention. Um, we fit models with and without a, a measure of green space in order to assess whether um, green space plausibly is a confounder of this effect of PM 2.5 on birth weight. And we found that it is, it does seem to confound the relationship. And then we wanted to know whether in real data, these fancy methods to control for spatial confounding seem to work well. So we pretended that we did not observe green space. And we asked whether including a flexible function of space in the model, instead of including this measure of green space, um, could control for potential confounding by green space. Um, the data that we used were uh, data from the California Department of Public Health's birth files. Um, we used these to capture all births in the state of California resulting from 2013 conceptions. We then geocoded the mother's home address and linked it to daily PM 2.5 levels at a one kilometer resolution averaged across the duration of pregnancy. And from the birth files, we extracted measured, um, measured potential confounders, rate ethnicity, parity, um, this codal check index of access to prenatal care, maternal age, and maternal education. And then we conjectured that green space could be a spatial confounder. And so for this, we used 2013 peak normalized difference vegetation index, that's NDVI measured at the census block level and again linked to the mother's home address. Um, after excluding observations with missing data or extreme implausible values, uh, we were left with a sample size of just over 450,000 births. And here are our results. Um, I'll, this is a lot, <laughs> I'll talk you through this and highlight what I want, um, the, the, the things that I think are most interesting here. So we fit three types of models. We fit a standard spatial regression model, and that's this first section. Um, we fit a double machine learning method that assumed homogeneity, but did not assume linearity. So it assumed that the effect was constant in space, but not necessarily constant in exposure. Um, and then we fit a double machine learning, uh, a fully non-parametric double machine learning method the, that allowed for nonlinearity and heterogeneity. And for each type of method, we fit a model that doesn't control for spatial confounding, that's this top line, a model that controls for um, green space using this measured variable and DVI, a, a model that pretends that NDVI is unobserved, so pretends that we don't have data on green space and uses a flexible function of space to try to control for it instead. And then uh, a model that, that controls for both NDVI and a flexible function of space. And you can think of this as 
Um, this model is controlling for other spatial confounders beyond green space. Um, so the, the conclusions that we draw from all of these many models are first, um, the effect estimate from, well, first let me say that I think uh, the, the best analysis in each of these three sections is the one that controls for both NDVI and spatial location. There's no reason not to control for both. Um, it can't hurt. And the first point to highlight is that the, the estimate from the standard linear model, this is the model that's been used or a version of the model that's been used in all previous analyses of this question um, is about half the magnitude of the most sophisticated model, um, 0.09 versus 0.16. And this suggests that linearity and homogeneity probably do not hold and this effect is probably biased. Um, this is just a more flexible model across the board. So it's unlikely to you know, it, it's not going to induce bias. Um, it's it's a more reliable analysis than this one. So this suggests that the standard analysis relies on assumptions that don't hold, um, and that assuming them erroneously, even though they don't hold, would result in bias. the The second thing to notice here is that controlling for spatial confounding, whether it's through NDVI or spatial location or both um, mitigates the naive estimate. So in all cases, the naive estimate is higher than the, the, the estimate that controls for spatial confounding. Um, and it seems that, you know, in the, the effect of controlling for NDVI green space directly um, seems pretty similar to the effect of controlling for a flexible function of space. Um, and so this seems to suggest that, in fact, controlling for a flexible function of space is able to capture much of the confounding due to green space when we leave NDVI out of the model. Um, I just want to close with the caveat that I would characterize these as exploratory analyses. We fit, we fit as you can see, many different models. We tweaked them after seeing results. None of these is meant to be a definitive answer to the scientific question. But I do think that these results are, well, first of all, these results are in keeping with previous analyses while still highlighting the fact that you can get substantively different answers when you um, move from the standard model to a more flexible kind of statistically and causally principled analysis. In conclusion, um, standard spatial regression models have some drawbacks. They make strong parametric assumptions that may not hold in practice. And when they don't hold, the results that you get from these models will generally be biased. Um, these double machine learning methods that we propose to use in this setting are much less likely to be misspecified. Um, and in order to move away from, in order to be able to use these kind of sophisticated machine learning methods, we recommend estimating a shift intervention causal effect. That's the average effect of a delta, an incremental increase in the exposure. Um, and this is preferable to estimating just the coefficient on the exposure in a linear regression model because it's interpretable even if the effect of a, an incremental increase in the exposure is different for different baseline exposure values. Um, and finally, it is possible to control for spatial confounding, that is unmeasured confounders that have spatial structure. But if you have an unmeasured confounder that has some spatial variation and some non-spatial variation, a confounder like income, um, then these methods could mitigate that confounding, but they would not fully control for it. Um, and that's a, a form of unmeasured confounding that you can't deal with with these spatial, um, spatial regression methods. And with that, thank you very much for um, listening and inviting me here. Uh, and thanks again to my collaborators and co-authors, Brian, Joan, and Abby. Thanks, Betsy. That was great. Uh, we have a few minutes. Do, does anyone have a question? I'll see one in the chat from Tom that we could perhaps start with. Um, I'll, I can just read it. So Tom's asking Betsy if any of the methods incorporate spatial variation in exposure measurement error. So we know that there's uncertainty or possible mm. bias in the PM estimates themselves, for example. 
Yeah, that is such a good question. The answer is no, but they should. You know, that that should have that is another caveat to these analyses. Uh, and yeah, I have I I think uh, actually Joan and I have written us a, a totally we worked on a totally separate project about um, the some issues surrounding the measurement error that you can get when you're using a variable that is estimated from a model itself. Um, and uh, I don't know, I'll only say that that's a really good question and a definite weakness of um, our framework for causal inference using spatial data, but also just spatial, uh, you know, I, I know there are some solutions out there, but it's a it's a very hard problem, especially when you're after a, a causal effect. And I don't know that there's a satisfying answer or method that can really handle it in a principled way. Thanks, Betsy. Anyone else have a question? I have a question. Uh, where did, oh, sorry, I was looking for Betsy on my screen. She said, oh, hi, first, like, thank you so much for the talk. It was really helpful. And the question that I have for the, in the bar plots where you have a spline, that spline is referring to a spline and the spatial term, right? Or are you, or did you test a spline in both the spatial term and the exposure? We did both. So one of our, and Brian, jump in if I say something wrong, because Brian actually did all of these <laughs> analyses. Um, but we, the, one of the, the seven standard models that we considered had a spline only on space. One of the machine learning non it's not machine learning might be overstepping it, but one of the non parametric models that we considered had um, splines on the everything. <laughs> Um, okay. Is that right, Brian? Yeah, so, so if you use this, if you have, let's say, two spatial dimensions and an exposure, you could have, you could use a two dimensional spline over the spatial dimensions and then an additive effect with the exposure. Mm -hmm. And um, that would be a standard method. Yeah. Um, and then the other way you could do it is to, there, there, are, there are really three ways you could do it. You could do that. You could have a spline over all three variables jointly, or you could have a spline over the two spatial oh, variables see. plus a smooth of the exposure. Okay, I see. Because I, what I was thinking is just like whether adding, uh, having the additive effect and the exposure and then just the, two-dimensional spine and the exposure could also be um, yeah, a, a yeah. So, so that Yeah, that, that strategy relaxes the assumption of linearity. So you're no longer assuming in a linear effect of the exposure, but you are assuming that that, that, that smooth of the exposure is like the dose response curve for the exposure, right? And you're assuming that is the same for everybody because you don't let that smooth term vary by space. So that so that so it's relaxing the assumption of linearity but not homogeneity. You're still assuming right. a homogeneous effect. So that could be a limitation. But I, I, I would agree that that is something you it's a reasonable it's a more reasonable model sometimes than a linear model. All right, thank you. And and just like the last question that I have, um, what are your thoughts on hierarchical models for addressing or for working with a spatial um, analyses? Um, our next project is looking into uh, models that are related to that. Uh, I, uh, what are my thoughts on hierarchical models? Uh, I guess uh, I think they share a lot of these limitations and that they're generally implemented in a parametric way where they're they're making like you have to have the theory to know how the variable how the variables in your model affect the outcome and specify that correctly and if you get it wrong you will get biased results so at least theoretically I I think the the double machine learning methods that I talked about are 
more principled and more general. Um, but I, I'm not sure I could, I'm not sure I could go more specific than that. And we also haven't like tested hierarchical models in simulations yet. We, I don't have compelling evidence the way we do for these spatial regression models. Right, um, thank but I think, you. I guess I would just say they share, the hierarchical models share some of the same limitations and kind of confusions about uh, the role of space in estimating causal effects. I don't know if that's too vague to be helpful, but. <laughs> no, that's, but that's helpful. That Thank you. Here. Thank you. I appreciate the effort on that. Thanks. Um, I see another question that asks if DM, double machine learning can analyze temporal variation in addition to spatial variation. And the answer is yes, in theory. Um, adding a third continuous dimension means you will need more data. You know, we already saw, um, I didn't get to talk about this, but in the, the real data application, we found that um, we really had to work hard to get BART, one of our, our double machine learning methods to work well. And we think that's because it just requires a lot of data. And that's with uh, two dimensions, just space to worry about. If you add a third dimension, we will need even more data. So theoretically, it's absolutely possible and not, not really different theoretically from having two dimensional space going to three dimensional space time, um, but it would require a lot more data. Thanks again, everyone. Thank you so much, Dr. Ogburn. And so thank you, thank you everybody for coming today. And I think you're on to your next meeting, right? Great. All right. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye. Nice Bye-bye. <laughs>